In this video, we look at some of the early, um, some of the early history, let's say, of um, how we came about uh, learning about DNA replication. And so, um, again, so if you, if in the previous video I talked about how I'll be labeling uh, what these, so this is both for standard and higher level students, and so uh, this is quite an important topic here. Um, this is, it, it's a bit of a tricky uh, topic to understand. So it's important um, and it's actually something I have to say, this is something that I always have to go back and, and I have to read up and I have to, I have to understand it over and over again. Um, but it is something, if you're able to understand this um, at, a, at a core level, um, it, it does make, uh, on a very logical level, it does make sense as to why DNA replication follows a so-called semi-conservative replication versus uh, the conservative or the dispersive replication. And so um, we'll look at uh, all of these different models here um, in just a second. And so semi-conservative replication, um, just by definition, and so this is actually, uh, if you have, if you're, uh, if you have, if you're one of my students, you've got uh, the PowerPoint that is, uh, that is named the same uh, semi-conservative replication on Google Classroom. Uh, make sure you have that open um, as it has all of the diagrams and it's, uh, it's easier to follow on that as well. Um, semi-conservative in terms of uh, DNA replication, it just means um, that the DNA uh, actually, let me do this in a different color. Red is not always the best here, especially when red is being used. Uh, DNA replication. Uh, that this is DNA replication that produces uh, two copies. Uh, each of them, each copy, always producing or containing. Uh, one of the original strand. And so I'm gonna do a little bit of color coding here. And if you look at this um, left diagram right here, um, you'll notice that um, you have a parent strand and, and you're gonna, uh, there's gonna be a lot of terms that you start to look at. Uh, in general, when we look at a original strand, we can either call something an original and a new strand, or we can call them a, a parent and a daughter strand. And so we have a parent strand right here, which is in red. And we have a daughter strand, uh, which is in purple. And so I will actually try, uh, I'll try and keep them um, as uh, color coded as possible. So you have a, uh, one of the original strands. And so this is after replication. So one of the original strands um, and the um, so one new strand. And so what we're looking at is if we're taking this to be the original uh, the original uh, DNA strand right here, you're going to have the strand splitting apart during replication. Each strand is going to act as a template. And so, uh, each strand uh, is a template, uh, template. Um, and then each strand, um, so each strand is going to be a template. Each new DNA strand is going to contain, or each new double strand is going to contain one parent strand and one newly synthesized complementary strand. And so the complementary strand is the purple one here and the parent strand is this one. So you have one parent strand, one complementary strand, and the same thing over here. So now you have from the single strand, single parent strand, you've now created two complementary. And if you look at the DNA, um, the sequence here, the sequence is exa it's exactly the same, but now you have double the amount of DNA from that single parent strand. Uh, there's just two, uh, two copies of it. And so, there is, we will look at the process, the internal process of what happens in replication, the unzipping and the re-zipping of the parent and the daughter strands. Um, but just in terms of ha what happens in these, in these processes is important um, to understand here. And so this model right here, the semi-conservative model, we didn't 
didn't just come up with it right away. Just like we didn't come up with the, uh, the, cell, uh, the cell membrane model right away, we didn't come up with this model or scientists didn't come up or didn't come across this model right away. There were two other models um, that scientists actually thought beforehand. Um, the first one, um, uh, the first one that came up was uh, the conservative replication. And the conservative replication was that you have the original two strands uh, were taken as a original template. So the, so the conservative take leaves the original DNA as a template and essentially makes a duplicate copy, essentially makes a duplicate like a, a photocopier. And so it makes an a, a exact a replica. So if you look at this, uh, if you look at this uh, diagram right here, it's taking the parent strand. It's not taking any part of the parent strand. It just takes, it's somehow taking a, a photocopy of the parent strand and just creating a brand new double strand from out of nowhere. And so um, this was something that was, and we'll look at the experiment that was done to disprove this um, in just a second. Um, but this was found to be a very, it was not, it was not a biologically significant um, uh, uh, strand or a method of DNA replication at the end of it. So it essentially makes a duplicate uh, new strand um, containing new DNA base pairs. The third model was the dispersive strand. And if you look at the, dis sorry, the dispersive, mo uh, dispersive model, and if you look at the, the diagram here, the dispersive model uh, t sort of takes bits and pieces of both. And so it takes bits and pieces of the parent, um, creates a, a, a bit of a copy, takes that, creates a copy of the daughter, um, then takes the, the next bit of copy, uh, the next piece of the parent and creates more. And so you get distinct regions of DNA composed both of original and uh, the new strand. So this is, it was just um, a mixture of both parent and daughter strands um, with distinct regions of DNA just, and, and just producing copies based on this mixture of both the parent and daughter strands. Um, again, both of these were not found to be biologically significant. Um, and what this basis was uh, built upon um, was on what we call the measles and stall experiment. Um, there is a QR code here that you can use um, to go, uh, I believe it goes to a uh, YouTube video. There's a few YouTube videos that you can find that are quite good in um, explaining uh, the measles and stall experiment. Um, measles and stall, um, what they did, I think this was back in 1958. Uh, this was right at the start um, where at the height of when, or not the height, but at the very beginning of when we were starting to uh, figure out how to tag uh, molecules um, with uh, different materials to be able to track them. And so what they actually ended up doing was they, they used, um, they used the DNA of E. coli, uh, Escherichia coli, um, in studying the DNA replication. And remember, the reason why they used um, E. coli uh, was that, remember, bacteria grow quickly, and so it's really easy to get um, multiple generations of bacteria uh, very, very quickly. And so uh, a lot of times when you're trying to do these experiments, you have you need lots of generations of uh, of uh, uh, of organisms in a very short amount of time, and you need to be able to uh, use a model organism that is able to provide that. And so if a prokaryote is not able to do it, usually um, if a bacteria is not enough and you need a eukaryote, often um, the most common is something like a fruit fly, 
uh, which will give you, um, you know, in the, in the span of about a week, you can get quite a lot of uh, offspring. And so there's quite a few different model organisms that are used depending on the type of experiment that you're doing, uh, depending on the rate of reproduction that you require. And so for them at the time, they were okay with just doing this experiment using bacteria, um, knowing that bacteria can grow very, very quickly. And so they would get results uh, super, super fast. And so what they did, um, remember that um, the DNA, the bases of DNA are uh, made of nitrogen. And so nitrogen, um, so the nitrogenous bases, what they ended up doing was they, end, they actually ended up growing uh, e. coli in a culture that was made of heavy nitrogen 15. And so uh, they, they specifically made uh, their DNA with this heavier isotope of nitrogen in the bases. Um, and so when they were, in, they would be able to use this difference between a heavier nitrogen and in a later um, part of the experiment where they use a lighter nitrogen, um, they would be able to tell the difference based on weight of DNA or the mass of DNA. Um, they would be able to tell the difference um, be, uh, and tell the difference with how the DNA has been uh, split. And so they use this heavier uh, nitrogen 15 uh, to grow this E. coli culture. And so as the, D as the E. coli are growing and, they're, and, they're, uh, and they're, the many generations of E. coli are dividing, they're only dividing in this, e. in this heavy nitrogen 15. So all of their DNA nitrogen bases are only being made with nitrogen 15. And so when you when you put their uh, when you take their DNA and you spin them in a centrifuge, um, you're going to have all of the DNA that all of that nitrogen 15 um, is going to spin to the bottom because it, all of it is heavy DNA. And so in this box right here in the start box, um, I know it's a small area, but try and try to see if you can fit it. Uh, I'll try and summarize it as much as I can. Um, uh, e. coli uh, grown to divide in presence of nitrogen. 15. Nitrogen 15, again, is the heavy nitrogen. The other one we're going to look at is nitrogen 14. Um, nitrogen 15, so this means that all DNA now has nitrogen. Has nitrogen 15 on it. Um, and so when uh, the DNA is spun in a centrifuge, so when spun in a centrifuge. Remember, when anything you spin in a centrifuge, things always spin and they separate by uh, mass. And so things that are heavier fall to the bottom, anything lighter stays to the top. When spun in a centrifuge, nitrogen 15 goes to the bottom. So that was the first thing they had to do. They had to make sure that they had enough colonies of uh, E. coli that, um, or all of, their, all, of the, all of the E. coli bacteria had nitrogen 15 in their DNA itself. And so at, um, at, the, at, uh, at the start, um, and, and so we're gonna go back and forth between pages three and four here um, and drawing the strands of uh, DNA. So at the start right here, um, you've got uh, with the, let's say the semi-conservative. You've got the conservative and you've got the dispersive. So the first thing you have is right at the start, all of your, um, all of the DNA that's in the test tube, uh, all of that is going to be uh, 
and I'll label this here, this is all going to be uh, nitrogen 15, right? Because that's the only source of nitrogen that's available right at the start. Now, after the first cycle, we're trying to separate and we want to cause uh, DNA replication to occur. Now, what's going to happen is that at the first cycle, um, what we're trying to do is we're transferring all of that bacteria um, to, a, uh, to a different solution that has a lighter nitrogen. So we transfer... transfer bacteria to lighter nitrogen, and this is nitrogen 14, and then we allow the nitrogen to divide. And so what's going to happen here after cycle number one, and you just have to think about the mechanisms that we remember from the page here in terms of the semi-conservative, the conservative, and the dispersive models. Um, take my screen to lift these up. So cycle one. So what's going to happen is we're splitting each of these up, and we're now going to have one strand. Well, technically, so in the semi-conservative model, uh, the semi-conservative model says that you have one strand acting as the template, the second strand acting as uh, uh, or the second, or both strands acting as a template with a new strand being put in. And so what's going to happen here is that you have a one strand like this with a new strand going in like that and one strand going in like this and let's say a new strand going in like that. Right? So that would be your semi-conservative model right there. You have the purple which is your nitrogen 15 from the original. And you have the black one, which is your nitrogen 14 from the mixture in the new solution. In the conservative model, we were told that it makes an exact, it makes a carbon copy from the material that you, uh, that it was given from. So uh, what actually ends up happening here is that um, there's no input from this uh, material right here. So you actually, the parent from, uh, from the top right here actually remains the same. And so what actually ends up happening is that this remains as nitrogen 15, and you actually end up having an entirely new double helix forming that is nitrogen 14. And then for the dispersive model, we know that you're going to have um, one, both of the both of the double helixes, uh, helices, um, they're going to be mixtures of both of them, um, and so they're going to be sort of like that. Uh, let's see if I can do this properly. If you get the gist of that, there, it's going to go like that, and it's going to be the same thing uh, on the other side. So um, in this case, you have a mixture of both the nitrogen 14 and the nitrogen 15. So this is a mixture of nitrogen 14 and nitrogen 15. Now the issue here, um, and, and the reason why they were able to take out one of the uh, models here, um, is that on their um, test tubes right here, if we were to look over here, uh, after cycle number one, they were able to get a very clear distinction um, that uh, they had a, that there was um, in the test tubes itself, um, when they put the, when they put the DNA in the centrifuge, that there was some heavy material and some light material. And so what that showed was that one strand of the DNA or one part of the DNA had, um, if you took one, uh, one of the double helixes. So this is assuming that you take one of the double helixes um, and, and put them in the centrifuge. You've, you've got one or part of the double helix 
um, has heavy material, one has uh, light material. And so for both the semi-conservative and the dispersive at cycle number one, um, you have parts of each of the double helices where you have both nitrogen 14 and 15. But for the conservative model, um, you either have one double helix, which has all nitrogen 14, or one double helix, which has all nitrogen or uh, nitrogen 15 and nitrogen 14. So for this one, you would have, if you were to take a sample from one of the double helices, you would only have one band on the centrifuge showing you that you only show one type of uh, one type of uh, uh, one type of nitrogen. When in reality, when you spun it in the centrifuge, right, uh, and this was in the actual experiment, when they did spin this in the centrifuge, when spun in centrifuge, uh, all DNA uh, was in the hybrid form in nitrogen 14, nitrogen 15 form. And remember, this is a single double helix. And so if we're looking at just a single double helix, the only single double helix, the helices that have um, both a, a nitrogen 14 and a nitrogen 15 are this one, this one, this one, and this one. So these ones automatically are out. So at this point, right at cycle number one, we know that the conservative model is out. Uh, so measles and Stahl already could tell right, right there and then that the conservative model was not the way um, that DNA replication could occur. But at this point, they could not tell um, whether um, it was semi-conservative or whether it was the dispersive model um, that was the uh, definitive model uh, that was causing or was allowing uh, this uh, DNA replication to occur, which then uh, takes us to cycle number two. So cycle number two, um, what they then allowed was uh, they allowed the, uh, the bacteria, uh, the uh, allowed bacteria, they allowed the bacteria to grow in the nitrogen 14, so that's the lighter nitrogen. So they allowed that they they left the bacteria in there. They kept the bacteria replicating in the nitrogen 14 medium. And so after cycle number two, and remember we don't have to do the conservative model anymore. And so after cycle number two here, what we're now going to see and all the strands divide and remember. For, we have to remember all of these strands um, as separate entities. Um, what you're actually going to end up seeing here is that you have molecules here that are going to start showing up um, that don't actually, um, that are going to start showing up um, which, uh, which are going to disprove the model for dispersive, uh, uh, for the dispersive model. And so, uh, so in terms of in terms of cycle number two, um, what they found here was if you were to if you were to divide both of these right here. So if we if we divide these two right here, you end up getting a uh, let's say a purple strand right there, which is going to get a new black one. Remember, black is the N14, but this is also we're dividing a black one, which is getting a normal black one. That's from the new one. We're also going to divide these two, which is also going to be a black one, which is getting a black one, but it's also got a purple template. And then that's going to get a black one as well. So what's happened here is you've kept two of them as normal, but now we've actually created two copies um, based on, and these are, remember, these are based on the two uh, N14 copies that were already in cycle one, um, but because we've kept it um, uh, in uh, N14 for cycle two, um, 
there's more abundance of uh, N14 now, and so the N14 is us using um, the nitrogen 14 copies to make its own copy uh, or make another copy. And so these are now uh, N14, uh, N14 daughter strands. Whereas what happens in um, in cycle number two for dispersive, and I'm not going to make these because it's just uh, too long to make, but what you end up getting is that you get four strands um, of mixed uh, variety uh, of a mixed variety um, DNA helixes, just as you saw up here. And so when you actually spin this, um, when you spin this in the centrifuge, and this is where the dispersive model is actually disproven, um, when spun in a centrifuge, so if you take uh, all of these right here and you're looking at uh, cycle number two here, uh, half, um, are uh, half are above uh, half are above the DNA um, to the ones from before. So in terms of where we're looking at in terms of the levels, um, if this was the level right here, you now have this blue line right there. Uh, if I can just zoom in right there, there's a blue line right here that's showing, remember, the higher it is, the lighter the material is. And, and so what we, we, what we now end up having is that we have this intermediate right here that was there. It's not a heavy, it's not a heavy material, it's a hybrid, but we also now have a band that's showing up in the centrifuge that is a light band. And now, and that correlates with our hybrid bands right here. So we have half the DNA that's hybrid, half of it that's a, that's a light band. It's not correlating with what we have here, which is all, it should all be four hybrid bands because they're all mixed together. And so the, that, that cycle number two is already showing us the experiment, or it's already showing the results that uh, the centrifuge is not giving us the right results for the dispersive. And so at this point, the dispersive model is inaccurate. And so if you were to con continue this for cycle number three, and I would, uh, I, if you have access to this, if you don't have access to the PowerPoint, you can still do this as sort of a thought experiment, um, continue this as cycle number three, uh, put cycle number three at the bottom of this page. Um, cycle number three continues, and I'll write the instructions down for this. Um, it just loads up. So cycle number three uh, continues in the nitrogen 14 uh, uh, solution. The centrifuge, it will again be spun in the centrifuge, and again, it's going to show a light band and a hybrid band, and that's because you're going to take um, a template right here, a template right there, a template here, and a template there, and now you're starting to see even more separation, um, but it's going to show a direct representation of what you're getting in terms of the types of uh, uh, in terms of the types of uh, nitrogenous bases that you have uh, in your DNA. And so this is, a, this is an experiment that can be done in the lab. This is a, it's, it's sort of, uh, it, it was something that um, at that time was, it was a brand new experiment that was done, but this is a, it's an experiment that once understood um, is quite an easy experiment. And so I would really recommend going through this. Um, if it doesn't make sense, go, go through, find some YouTube videos that are really good. Uh, other videos with animation specifically um, that help you understand um, this experiment, uh, but it really is, uh, you really need to understand this in terms of uh, understanding the process of replication um, before we move on to the actual process of replication um, in the next, uh, starting in the next video.